Good afternoon. On behalf of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines Online, the best of New York. New York Wine Classic Award winners hosted by Kevin Zarelli. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may find it helpful to log out and log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar, the chat and Q&A sections. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the dropdown to field as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have the Q&A section. This is a way for you to communicate with other on-screen panelists and ask your questions. Be sure to enter any questions for the panelists in the separate Q&A section, and we will do our best to get to all of the questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce Kevin Zarelli. Kevin is an award-winning wine writer and one of the world's foremost wine educators. Kevin has been teaching wine for 50 years, sharing his passion with thousands of eager students from all walks of life. He has written eight books about wine and food, including his annually updated Windows on the World Complete Wine Course, which has sold more than 4 million copies, making it the number one wine book in the United States. Kevin is the youngest person to receive the James Beard Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011, recognized for his commitment to making the study of wine accessible and fun for all. We look forward to having him do just that with us today. Kevin, I hand the mic to you. Uh, and thank you for having me. And I, I'm very, very lucky to, I'm a New Yorker. You know, this is where I live. I grew up in Westchester County and I'm live from New Paul's, New York. Uh, and uh, um, uh, thanks for being here. I was actually looking uh, in New York State. I have a book, uh, here it is, The Wines of America. The Wines of America uh, by Leon Adams from, you can see how much I've read this book. And it says uh, the the, uh, uh, the Hudson River Valley, where I am right now, which is not included today in today's tasting, uh, is the um, first place in the United States to uh, to uh, grow grapes and make wine. And I just wanted to let you know, because all those nice things that you said about uh, what I've done, but I've tried six times here now to grow grapes. I was only successful once. This is the only wine I've ever made, uh, a West Park Chardonnay uh, in, in from West Park, New York. Uh, and um, we should actually take a, a go to our, our people that we're having here today and get to their wines right away. So I would like to introduce, if I can, uh, Karim, Karim Masood, which rhymes with dude. There he is right there. Eric Bilka at Pindar and Bruce Mary uh, and um, his wife, Diana, in the picture at Boundary Breaks. And we're also gonna taste another rosé. Uh, we're gonna taste the rosé from uh, Ryan Williams. He won't be with us today, but we'll be doing that uh, all together. So, should we begin? Rebecca, back to you, or back to me. I certainly hope that you all have your I Love New York water uh, cup here right now. And uh, so Karim, are you, uh, Karim is here. Best sparkling one of the year. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't have it, I have it. And by the way, I thank you. I see a lot of the people that I know, all the, uh, the top people in the industry who are now, um, who are now with us watching our tasting. So I hope that you all, I know you all have the wine. Uh, Karim, you don't have a glass though. You just have the wine. I, you know, I mean, would help that you have your glass. It's all poured and everything. So a toast. This is this is the best sparkling and winery of the year. Karim, toast to you. Toast to my other panelists here. Eric, Bruce, you're not joining us. Bruce is on a Bruce is flying the plane yeah. right now. Here's Bruce. Trying get, trying to, as you can see, he's in the up in the sky. Anyhow, Karim, a toast to everybody. Let's try it first and see what we got. So I think everybody should know right right off the bat, which they can see, we got Method Champenois here. And this is, uh, you know, uh, the best way, the only way for me to have a great sparkling wine. So uh, tell us about the wine, Green. Why do you like it so much? Um, I think it's a really versatile wine. You can have it uh, as, as we should, uh, not just on special occasions, but every day. And it's a really food-friendly wine. 
And as my father likes to say on, on Long Island, we produce island wines. And what does that mean? It, it suggests, uh, you know, enjoying our wines with, with the, the, the bounty we're so lucky to, to, to harvest from the sea, all the seafood that surrounds us. And so this really goes well with all the fruits of the sea, with, with shellfish and, 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 you know, other fish that we get landed on our shores. And uh, so it's, as you can see, it's kind of light, light to medium bodied. It's, it's on the lighter side, but, but it's, it's quite dry. And, uh, and this spent, what's important to know about this wine, it spends a minimum of three years uh, on tirage before it's disgorged uh, or even four years because we do multiple disgorgements um, before, um, before it's released. I'm just sort of curious because you know, uh, I cover all wines. Uh, of course, I, the best wines in the world are from New York State. It's obvious. Uh, we're not going to even test that market here right now. But, you know, we all have gone places, uh, you know, uh, uh, to make my Chardonnay. Of course, I went to Burgundy. I went to California to see what they're doing. Was there something that got, I mean, you make a lot of wines, okay? How many actually are, are you producing right now? Um, we, in any vintage, we could produce up to two dozen different labels. We don't do that every year, but they're... Right. they're some vintages we get close to two dozen different wines um, that for a long time we didn't make bubbly and uh, we actually bought um, um, you know cases of bubbly from from our neighbors down the road like lens in fact uh, the, the we, we make the base wine at, at, at Pamanac but yeah all the Metro Chempenois work occurs at lens winery down the road and so back in uh, 2009, we said, you know, why don't we start making our own? We, we drink enough of our own. And plus, uh, we, think there, we, we think there's a real space for it here um, on Long Island. And, and it's, done really, it's been really well received by our wine club members when we do wine dinners. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the winery um, and people, you know, enjoy it at home as well. Well, I guess my question was, where did you go? I, I'm, obviously, you, you've been doing this a very long time. We're gonna talk about your family, uh, yeah. you know, who started the whole thing your brothers, but the, uh, is there a, a, a sparkling house, a champagne house that does it for you? Uh, we can advertise them as well. Um, I, I wouldn't pick one in particular, uh, and Boulanger is definitely one that uh, I enjoy, and there are many others, and there's a small smidgen of, of uh, inspiration there to, in this wine, but really all of our wines, while there are old world and other standards we look at, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're making wines that we like to drink and, and that are expressive of our region. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you tried it. Bruce, you tried it. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I shouldn't put it that way. Eric, are you doing any sparkling or bubbling at your place? In yeah, we do. We do two different uh, methods, Champenois, one a Pinot Meunier based and one a Chardonnay based. Um, so they, they've been doing that for many years um, here. At, that was one of the original things that they did at Pindar. So we've kept the tradition going. I've bottled uh, two at this point and we've discord one of them already. So, so this, is the, this is only the second time you're saying? Second vintage? For, for me, since I've only been oh. here since 2018. Okay. So okay. I've bottled two different uh, sparklers here and we've discord one of them at this point. Bruce, I mean, you're new, you're, you're actually, if I may say this right now, you know, uh, you're, you and I uh, are collecting social security. I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, the other two guys are still paying social security. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, yeah it's very, you very glad to be. <laughs> and we appreciate it. But, but Bruce, uh, uh, I know we're going to, I love your your wine that uh, you're, I don't, I'm not going to call it a dessert wine. If you want to call it a dessert wine, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But when it comes to sparkling wine. Yeah, we yeah, we do. So we make both a sparkling uh, Riesling and a sparkling Gewürztraminer. We don't go to the extra mile that Kareem and Eric do. This is a, a forced carbonation method that we use, and it gives us a very um, nice amount of effervescence, and particularly with Gewürztraminer, which a lot of people find to be a little on the heavy side sometimes. If you add a little carbon dioxide to that wine, it just makes it a really beautiful experience that people are, are, are discovering. So Riesling and Gewürztraminer uh, are both on our shelves. And actually, uh, um, thank you for the introduction when we were talking about it. This is actually, it's, 50, it's 51 years, just so everybody knows. I've been crazy enough to stay in this business for, well, 
uh, actually 51 years I, I, ago, I started teaching the Windows on the World. Uh, no, excuse me, it was a, a wine school and then eventually became the Windows on the World School. And when I started back in those days, which was 1970, uh, there, uh, uh, sorry guys from Long Island, you didn't exist, okay? I mean, you weren't around. Uh, at least Bruce, ha you know, he's got, he looked at the history of the Finger Lakes and said, well, this has some history here right now. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that because I'd like to know, you know, uh, I live in an historic town of New Paltz. It's one of the oldest streets in America, you know, houses going back into uh, the late 1600s. Uh, and so I'm saying to myself, uh, you know, that's what Hudson Valley has a little, uh, um, you know, stuff going on for it, historical wise. But I, as I said uh, to all my people that are here right now, I wanted to get to the um, to the wines first and to the discussion second. Uh, so I am now moving, if I can, to Pindar, uh, Dr. Dan's signature. And I, of course, I would want to talk about Dr. Dan uh, as we go on here right now. Now, this is the 2020 Gewürz demeanor. The one that you, you won was the 2019. And of right. course, when you win something like that, Eric, it just went out the doors. Is that correct? Well, God. We, were, we were sold out before the results were even announced. So uh, our customer base picked up on it pretty early that it was special. Uh, we feel that 2020 is, is just as good, though. So uh, definitely excited about it. So tell us, uh, um, again, you also produce uh, uh, a lot of wines. Um, and um, I, do, is, this, is Gewürz Dominion something you just put a little extra effort into, uh, you know, to, to get it to this level? Well, to be honest with you, they, there has never been a release of this Gewürz at, at Pinar before. So okay. uh, we have a block, a six acre block right behind the tasting room. Um, and I felt it was special enough that we bottle it as its own thing. And so that's why we came up with the Dr. Dan Signature series, um, Gewürz Demeanor. We wanted to pay homage to the founder and I felt that it was reserve level. So that's why we gave it that designation. And as we've seen, it sold out really quick. And then the awards came in after we were already out of it. We actually scrambled through Alethea, one of the owner's basements to find a bottle to have for the, uh, the night of the classic awards. So uh, luckily we, we got to taste it one time <laughs> after we received the award. Well, let's go to this 2020. We all have it, correct? And uh, I always say, if you can say Gewürz Dominion, you can buy it, but everything is in the nose. You know, I mean, that's that spicy, whatever you want to call it, lychee nut, actually. That's a little bit of what I'm getting in here. Um, of course, if you don't like Chinese food, you don't know what lychee nut is, so it's not going to work out. But a toast uh, to the Gewürztraminer and to the things that are actually happening. And congratulations to Pindar on this wine. Cheers, Eric. Thank you. And it's low in alcohol. I think it was 12%. Am I correct? About it? I, didn't, I forgot what that This one is actually 11.9%. Okay. So, yeah, it's not an alcohol bomb. Um, right. It's the, the acid isn't particularly high either. Uh, the pH is a very reasonable point. So uh, it's just well balanced and it really fills the mouth. It's rich, it's full. Uh, we, very happy with the outcome here. So I guess, I guess what I was referring to about low alcohol as compared to other American wines. Yeah, uh, correct. Uh, you know, uh, and not just American wines, but just watching the uh, sugar levels go up around the world and also seeing the alcohol levels going up around the world. Um, Bruce, you're saying you got some Gewürz. What, what do you think of this? Well, I'm going to be honest. I we we're not. I have not opened it because I've got a whole crew of young people in my organization, and I like to open these wines when everybody that is likely to find them unique or at least taste one for the first time. These are the best wines in New York from 2000 from the last year. So, I'm I'm saving this one. I'm saving this one. You're a built-in educator, Bruce. Yeah. You, know, you, you can. I mean, the wine classes. The great thing about a wine class is you can do you know, uh, 15 people per bottle, uh, you know, and spread out the wealth. Yeah, and Eric Eric, and Kareem are not just down the road from me, so it's hard to come across these wines. So I want to kind of make it make it a, a special occasion. Are they going to send a case to you? Don't worry, right? No, they're, no, they're not. <laughs> okay. Kareem, any thoughts uh, on the Gewurz? I like it. See, Kareem's, nice. not waiting. Kareem's not waiting for anybody. He's trying the wines right now. So. <laughs> I'm going to share what's left of my bottle. But I hear what Bruce is saying too. And I'm happy to swap wine. I'd love to swap wine. 
Um, I think it's a very nice wine, Eric. Congratulations. I mean, the 2020 is young, obviously, but uh, it's a uh, clean, fresh, uh, pretty classic example. I think the, the lychee style notes are a little bit more present than the floral notes, but it, I like it. And I'm gonna come back, uh, Eric. Uh, um, I'm sure you put this out, but when it comes to food, uh, I have my own thing on Give uh, what, what works with it, because it's sort of, a, it's a unique wine, there's no doubt about it. In the world, Gewürztraminer is one of the unique wines. So what, what do you, uh, and may I mention, it's very, very important for you to mention this, that Eric, uh, is, his background is hospitality. And there's a lot of people from in the hospitality business uh, listening here to the show right now. And chef cooking and all that other kind of, I don't actually know, Eric, and I've been around a long time, uh, of uh, a, a somebody who, was in the restaurant hospitality business, cooking business, chefing business, and now is a winemaker. I, if anybody else has somebody they can think of, I'd like to know, but has that helped Eric, uh, you in, in, in making wines? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one thing I've been blessed with is I've always been good at eating and drinking. So, um, you know, I've always had a good palate. I've always enjoyed food. I've always enjoyed good beverage. So it, it, the synergy has always been there. Um, I believe uh, Christopher Tracy, a Channing Daughters is also, I think he was a chef at one point or in the restaurant business at least. Um, yes. and, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's, there's others. I mean, it just makes sense. I went to school for hotel restaurant management at Niagara University. So I had the opportunity to take uh, a wine making course and, you know, being in, getting into the hospitality industry, it afforded me the ability to travel a lot. I lived in Alaska, I lived in St. Thomas. Uh, you know, people eat and drink everywhere, so there's always a job. Um, but it's, it, it, it's a tough lifestyle as well. You know, late nights, uh, it's a lot of fun, but uh, at a time, at some point, it, it's time for a change. And, and I'm glad I made that change and moved to Long Island to try and break in. And so actually, I want you to know, uh, uh, Bruce, that uh, Eric is going to bring down and he's going to bring some of uh, Kareem's wine down on his motorcycle. OK, uh, just so you know, we have to add, you know, I've always looked at like finding these different what's going on behind everything. You know, I mean, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bruce, uh, uh, you're from New York. You know, I'm from New York. You know, Eric is from New York. Kareem, where's the family from? That's a story that I think is a fascinating story. It is, and we don't have enough time, but briefly, I mean, uh, my, my, my parents, um, who you know, Kevin, uh, my, my mother was born and raised in the Pfalz in Germany, and my father was born and raised in Lebanon, and they, they met in the obvious place in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, they always had a dream. Huh? I was just saying the Philadelphia story. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and they always had this sort of romantic dream of maybe becoming vintners uh, themselves one day. Uh, but my father wasn't going to just walk away from his career at IBM. And, uh, um, and so we, we, my brothers and I grew up in, in, in Stanford, Connecticut, at which point my father was working for IBM in New York City. And it was around the time we settled in, in Stanford that my parents read an, an article in the New York Times about, uh, about the Hargraves, about the first winery on Long Island. And long story short, they began to say, you know, we might be able to do, realize our dream in our own backyard. We, might, we don't have to look for a vineyard in Germany, which is what they had been thinking about, my, my, my relatives there. And uh, long story short, they, they finally closed on this property, our home, our home farm where I am, I'm sitting, where, where, the, where the winery is, where I'm sitting now uh, in 1983. And so here we are in our 38th growing season. And um, I just want to shout out to my, my family my parents, who I already mentioned, but my two brothers as well, uh, Nabil, our vineyard manager, and Salim, our ad administrative manager, who, uh, you know, um, winemaking is, is never a solo sport. It's always a team endeavor. And so my family and our whole team at Pamanak, um, you know, I salute you. Cheers. And there's always that thing, the family that uh, drinks together stays together. And actually, Rebecca, I don't know if you can still go back, uh, Rebecca's, uh, help, uh, go back to that picture because I, I find it a fun, fun picture, especially with, uh, uh, I, you know, if you have that picture in my, uh, in my parents' living room. Um, and we've yeah, had... so tell, tell us, uh, I, I think I know who your parents are. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to take a guess here right now. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm on the left. Okay. 
and then my brother Salim is in the middle, and then uh, Nabil is the short one in this photo. He has the the shovel and and, and the rake there, uh, but he's now the tallest. And and I have to comment about the boots. I mean, they're very very nice, you know. Uh, so I hope you still kept them. You know, I, kept I, I think I grew out of them, but those were good rain boots. Yeah. Good well, I'm gonna. You, you guys don't have the next wine. Um, I, my, the, 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 everybody else out there has it, so you guys are gonna have to suffer uh, through. Uh, and wait a second here, right now. But with the, uh, if you have the, you don't have the Ryan Williams. But uh, here we go. This is the one that won. We're gonna. I'd like to talk about rosé. By the way, I didn't want to forget this. The Gewürztraminer. As somebody in the restaurant business, that's a wine by the glass. Okay, that's that's exactly what people are looking for. It's not overbearing. Uh, you know, we talk about food and things like that. But to me, uh, not all wines can be wine by the glass. You need something refreshing, easy, uh, and uh, as a starter. So uh, this, again, the nice thing about the Ryan Williams um, is it is, uh, as you can see, 100% Pinot Noir. And actually, Bruce, uh, when we get, I'm, I might not, may, might not even wait because I want to talk about Seneca Lake because where you are in a second. Another low alcohol, 12%. Uh, and I think this is what people are looking for. And it's uh, it's got a, that salmon color. It's not dark uh, rosé. It's medium, if you want to call it rosé. And and uh, you get actually, um, you do get some Pinot Noir coming out. I think it's nice to, to use a, I mean, rosé, come on, when I was growing up and when Bruce was growing up, we had something called Matus and Lancers. Does anybody remember that stuff? Uh, Kareem, I know you didn't, Eric, I know you never did any of that stuff. I've seen you know, it. You've seen it on the shelf, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what it was. And, and of course, one of the largest selling wines in the United States when I started was Riuniti. Remember that? Reunity on ice, that's nice. And of course we know uh, of our Long Island friends, the Mariannis now, <laughs> uh, with that, all that money they got from Reuniti are, are uh, now own the most acreage in uh, Tuscany under the name of Banffy. So it's all, it's all because of us, you know, putting it all together. But the taste, I toast uh, uh, Ryan, sorry you couldn't be here. Uh, well, again, of course the difference in between Reuniti and uh, Matus and Lancers is those had a little bit of what I call sparkle, carbonation, slight carbonation, and were sweet. And that's why in college, that's why we drank them. Uh, um, uh, of course, with the Matus and Lancers, the other reason you drank them is because you could put the candle in, you know, in your dorm, you could be the top person in your dorm with the, uh, the candle going. It's dry. And that's uh, another thing. Um, this is again, another uh, perfect wine by the glass. I, I'm, by the way, I'm bringing this up because I know who's on all the people that are here. Some of them have failed my wine class actually. Uh, so uh, they're still trying to learn and learn and learn. Uh, but, um, and this is a statistic I'm talking about, I'm sure you guys know this, maybe everybody's writing about it knows this, but when, when we were in operation in 2019 with restaurants and it's all coming back now, and I, I just watched everything being lifted uh, by, the, the, uh, by New York State is, and it will still continue, is that over 50% of all wine sold, over 50% of all wine sold in, in restaurants around the United States are wine, is wine by the glass. Uh, and so I think it's a win-win-win for everybody. I've always thought that way because, uh, you know, who, who, who wins? Well, uh, the winery drops 10 cases because they're not going to take one case uh, or 20 cases. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the consumer doesn't have to buy a full bottle. Uh, and, and then it just works out for everybody. And of course, as you know, restaurants do a little bit higher markup uh, on their wines uh, for wine by the glass. Uh, maybe. I'm sure most restaurants try to give it away. Um, but anyhow, it's a, uh, I can see why this one, a little bit, quick question, Kareem, Rosé, Rose, you, you make it, you like it, what's the story? Yeah, absolutely. Rosé, it's, it's so exciting to see the, uh, you know, the Rosé boom over the last several years. Um, what it says to me is that, uh, uh, you know, Americans are more open-minded about wine. It used to be some kind of like stigma if you had a pink wine in your glass and now the color is a large part of the attraction and it's just it's a fun wine and and i think it's sort of um, demonstrative of what's happening in this country i like to say that uh, the it's ironic because americans are becoming more european in their appreciation for for you know for food and wine and and in europe it's kind of the opposite they're becoming uh, more american the per capita wine consumption is europe in europe is generally going down and here it's generally going up and of course, there is a lot of rosé in that South Fork going down in the Hamptons. Uh, I see, I, 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 I see it being shipped out there. 
never to the North Fork, always to the South Fork. Uh, Bruce, even though you don't, you're way upstate, uh, what's going on in the Finger Lakes uh, with Rosé? What do you see? So those of us in the Finger Lakes have really Riesling as our, our key wine and, and Riesling never takes off sort of in, kind of without sort of explanation. It will next week, right. but that will take a while. But Rosé is one of those things that took off much to everyone's surprise. And it's nice when a region like ours can make a wine that actually kind of hits big in the market for once. So uh, it's been very popular up here. Um, there's great viticulturists up here. They can get this fruit ripe. And uh, I think that's what you're finding in this rosé. It's kind of got nice, you know, character because the fruit got ripe. And that's tough to do in a cold climate like we have. So great wine. I, I think the word you're using, Bruce, is a, is, is a very, very important word for all the wines. Balance. And the first three wines I have had today are extremely balanced where the fruits, there's no sweetness in these wines, but the fruit uh, and, and the acids and, and uh, there's really no tannin in them, but the fruit and the acid is balanced out. Um, and again, I, I, I remind people, I started in the Hudson Valley in 1970. I went to the three wineries that existed uh, in, in those days. Two of them are not even here anymore. Uh, and of course, there's many more that have come in, into being. And then I actually uh, went at 20, probably 20 years old, I went to uh, Dr. Frank and I started learning uh, wines from Dr. Frank. Basically, not a joke, I knocked on his door. He didn't know who I was. I didn't call, we didn't have cell phones. I just knocked on Dr. Frank's door and he opened the door and my hair was much longer than it is right now. And I think he was scared of the fact that I was even there on his doorstep. He said, what do you want? I said, I wanna learn how to make uh, wine. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of a great friendship. Uh, and, uh, but his wife didn't like my long hair. I just want you to know. Uh, Eugenia did not like the long hair and, and, and they had an argument in the kitchen. Is he going? He can't ask. He can't stay here. He's a hippie. Where's he going to go? Uh, anyhow, I grafted. I learned how to graft from Dr. Frank. And in those days, by the way, also uh, Bully Hill winery, which was Walter Taylor. And uh, uh, his, his first winemaker was, was Herman Weimer. Uh, and Herman Weimer, we all know Weimer wines, but Weimer had um, just come over from Germany. He actually didn't even speak English. I, I, you know, it's fun, fun days up in the Finger Lakes. And then, uh, Eric, I didn't want to forget about your thoughts about rosé. Uh, well, we make a lot of rosé, and we're using Syrah, Malbec, Pinot Meunier, Merlot, Cab Sauv, Cab Franc. We run the gamut. So I have lots of blending material here, and... Uh, we just, it just keeps getting more popular. We, uh, we sell out every year and that's what we want. Uh, well, this is the thing, uh, you know, um, uh, some, I know some of the people that are, that are watching because of windows on the world. Uh, and, um, and I, I uh, you know, we are 20 years out of September 11th, but we're all, you know, living here in New York and, um, and a lot of, uh, I don't want windows in the world ever to get lost. Um, and we had the largest uh, wine list for New York state. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about it uh, because I got there in 1976 and was put in charge and I had to, I had been working in a restaurant already where I was having New York state wines. Um, and, uh, but, um, Rosé in those days, uh, you know, up and down, sickle, go sickle, go sickle. And now it's there every, it doesn't make any difference if it's winter. People like the taste of, of, of the wine. It's not going away. And that's why everybody's getting on the bandwagon. Uh, uh, and they, why not? You're selling it out. That's the way it should go. So now, ah, uh, red wine. Okay, no, no offense. All right, I, I, I like a rich demeanor. I like uh, my the sparkling stuff, but I'm a red wine drinker. And this actually, to me, we're back over uh, to Pomona, best red and best winery of the year. Uh, this is fascinating for me because, again, remembering that the first uh, the first vineyards. Uh, were Hargrave Vineyards back in 1973. Uh, and they, everybody thought they were crazy. Uh, and here we are with 71% Cabernet Sauvignon, 13% Cabernet Franc, 8% Merlot, 8% Petit Verdot. We got a Bordeaux blend here. Uh, and so, and big bottle here, uh, Karim. I don't know if I'm making a statement that the wine is big and bold and, and now 13.5% alcohol, but I don't find that that crazy. Okay, so I'm just pouring it for, I like it right out of the bottle. I didn't pre-try the wines. I mean, I, I've had them before, as you know. And we have a wine, I remind everybody, talking about, uh, could you sell her a wine? Uh, you know, this is 2015, we got six years of age. Kareem, you're on, buddy. Tell us what we got here. 
Uh, well, this is like our flagship red blend. We don't make it every year. We only make it in what we declare to be a grand vintage. That's a term my father came up with back in the 93 vintage. Uh, we started making wine at Pamanak in 1990. And so when my father received the fruit from the 93 uh, crop, um, he, it was clearly, you know, a superior quality to what he had seen the prior three years. And he said, I can't put the same label on here. So we came up with this Grand Vintage uh, uh, designation. We make a Grand Vintage Merlot, Grand Vintage Cabernet Sauvignon, and so on. And, and in such a year, we produce the, the Assemblage, which is, of, of course, those who know French, this is the word that the French use for blend. My father, who speaks fluent French, you know, it's like, this, is, this would be a good name for, for our, our blend. And so that's how the, the, the name came to, the wine came to be. And like I said, we don't do it every year. And so for me as a winemaker, it's really, I would say the most fun wine to make because it's truly the wine I spend the most time doing the blending work. And, and that's, you know, just, that, that's like one of those, those memes when people were, this is what my mom thinks I do all day. This is what my friends think I do. This is what I really do. Well, this is the time when this is what I really do when, when people think what I do, which is sit there and blend the wine all day for uh, a couple of weeks until we arrive at the final blend. And so it's really a great deal of fun to, to make. Yeah. Did they teach you that at Wharton, by the way, how to blend wines or was that uh, drinking? How many things you could drink together? You know, you want to talk about those days or no? Want to let them go or talk about it? <laughs> I can talk about it, but I'd rather come back to the wine. So, all right, all right. Uh, just want to throw in a little bit of, you know. Uh, I saw a question uh, in the chat area from Len about yeah. uh, the talking about how we make this wine. Uh, it's so normally our Grand Vintage Reds spend about 16 months in barrel. And starting with the 2015 vintage, since most of the wine is under screw cap, which is ironic because the particular bottle I have here is a cork finish, but most of the bottling is under screw cap. That being the case, I, I know by now, because we've been doing it for, you know, uh, since, since the 07 vintage and 08 vintage, um, that the screw cap is highly effective at preserving the wine so much so that it obviates the need for additional preservatives in the form of sulfites. What's the point? The point is it's almost too good. Uh, it's almost too tight and it, to the point where it's really shutting down the development. And I'm sure a lot of people on, on this call know what I'm talking about. And so what I'm trying to do with the 15 is I gave it an additional year in barrels to allow the wine to develop right here in bulk in the barrel. Um, and so we got 28 months in barrel before it was bottled. And like I said, the idea was to try to get a little, a little additional development in barrel before it was bottled and uh, sealed with the screw cap, which really serves as a time capsule. And so when it is finally opened, including right now, I highly recommend decanting it. I mean, I plead guilty, I don't decant enough, but all the wines we make, uh, whites included, and even maybe rosé, but in particular reds like this uh, uh, benefit from decanting. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that I do in my wine school. By the way, it's still going on. I have a virtual Windows on the World virtual wine school. I've had 2,500 students in six months from 40 states around the country. It's, and, and what I'm saying is people want an education in wine. Uh, I'm not the only one doing it. I mean, Andrea Robinson is, is doing it. I think Karen McNeil is doing it. And it, 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 these are just unbelievable things. But I tell my students, and I'm, I like you, Eric, don't try it yet. Eric, don't try it. I'm watching. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Put your hand over the top. Because I think the number one thing in wine world in the wine world is the aromas. And these are, of course a young wine aroma. But you put your hand over the top and then you open it, blah boom. The intensity, and I hope everybody's doing it because it is it's not me, the intensity of the aromas are increased by five to ten percent. That's how but and also as a professional wine taster, there's a lot of I don't taste everything. I knock wines out when I'm doing professional wine tasting first on color, if I know what the category is, or this Cabernet shouldn't be that color. If it's a 2015, it shouldn't be there. It's out. Then I smell all the wines long before I put them in my mouth. And I'm going to knock wines out just based on that, especially when you're given like 200 wines to try. It's impossible to try to do it and, and taste them all. So here's what I'm going to do. Kareem, Eric, with me, Bruce, make believe. Uh, I'm going to Toast you guys, always toast. We forgot to toast this. You know, there's a lot of evil spirits where you guys live. Give the wine a try, leave it in your mouth for three seconds. Leave it, leave it in your mouth for three seconds, go. You know, I never watched myself. 
taste wine. But now on these Zoom things, I, I, I watch them again. I'm, what am I doing? People are even asking, what are you doing? Why are you doing that in your mouth? Because people forget. And people forget that it's not just your nostrils that you're going to smell your aromas and your bouquets. You got the nasal passage. This is the great thing about what I do too, is 25% of my students are medical, involved in medical, especially ear, nose and throat uh, doctors. And of course, the irony of this whole pandemic is uh, number one, uh, the number one thing for me is that, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, prohibition began. And of course, uh, no alcohol, no, no nothing, forget it. You can't make it, you can't drink it. And then a hundred years later, uh, it's an essential business. I think it's very important that we bring that up. And, and of course, I'm not spitting. I don't see anybody else spitting here right now because it's illegal to spit, okay? And think about watching a, a Yankee game or a Mets game or whatever. They can't spit anymore. They can't spit anything else out. And of course, the, the sense of smell. You know, I am drinking all of my wines. Uh, I, before the pandemic, I made a deal that I was going to any wines that are 20 years 20 years or, or older, they're gone. If I showed you the wines I've been drinking, you should come and join me is what I'm trying to say. But now it took me, uh, it took me a minute and I call it the one minute wine expert for that wine to finish. There were so many things. It was a powerful wine right at the very, very beginning. Uh, and, but as I'm sitting here right now at 60 seconds later, the tannins have dropped. It was, boom, I got everything. I got your 13.5% alcohol. I got your tannin. I got your fruits coming through. But now, I get, which I like, by the way, I call it uh, sour cherry at the end. Nice sour cherry. Uh, but the ta this is a wine, I don't, I don't know, I'd like to ask you, Karina, what you think. I, I, I could drink this wine now. I could drink this wine now. Um, it's not a wine by the glass. It needs food. Uh, and I, what, is your, what is your opinion about food with the, your uh, assemblage? Uh, yeah, I generally agree with that. I mean, uh, I think uh, I can drink it by itself too, and I think it's fun by itself, but I, I'd much rather have a steak au poivre, a ribeye, or, or eggplant parmesan, like some, you know, some roasted vegetables if you're not into beef these days. And, um, and you know, there's a whole range of go on and on, uh, an aged cheddar, I mean, um, but yeah, I um, definitely think, um, this is a food wine. Well, I, I also, for the vegetarians, uh, in, uh, to me, I'm thinking of a grilled portobello mushroom. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to say is uh, you can see how it's loaded with tannin. It's also loaded with acid. And, and you know, a lot of people are, are, in, are into that. Some people aren't. But, uh, you know, uh, I think that's one distinction that Long Island has versus uh, other parts of the country where we, we do have uh, acid in the reds and the whites. Well, I, I, I think it's a very important point to be made here because, uh, and, and a lot of people always think it's always tannin that's going to preserve a wine. You need the acidity as well. And the one thing that I always, with my students, I say, okay, you got a bottle of wine. There it is. Okay. How do you know when it's ready to drink? How do you know when a bottle of wine is ready to drink anyhow? That when the fruits and the tannins and the acids, and in, in the case of Bruce's wine, the, the residual sugars are in balance to your individual taste. That's when you know when you're going to drink the wine. Um, and, um, you know, and it, it, it's pretty easy. Uh, what happens to red wines as they get older, they lose color. We all know that. Uh, they also lose tannins. The tannins drop out and they go to tannin heaven and we can move on. Uh, but what's left is the alcohol doesn't change and the acidity doesn't change. And of course, that's when you know when a wine's going downhill, where the acidity becomes more prominent. Again, another balanced wine. Uh, Eric, you have it there. Uh, so, um, some comments on the wine and, and also are you making a, a bordeaux style blend or whatever you want to call it oh absolutely yeah yeah and our 2019 we just bottled our, our 2019 we're super high on them and uh really excited but you know back to the assemblage this is it's it's really nice it's kareem kudos on your use of oak i i really appreciate when it's not all new oak I hate when people <laughs> label something reserved just because it's in 100% new oak, new French oak. This, it's, you don't want to overpower the tannins from the grapes. And here you get that big lush grape tannin and the oak isn't overpowering and it's, it's refreshing. And I love the acid on it. Um, really nice wine. Thanks, Eric. And um, yeah. I was just going to say quickly the the, the moderate uh, judicious use of new oak is um, you know very deliberate. We've been sort of easing off the oak year after year, and 
for the exact reasons. Uh, I'm in the same boat, so I, you know, I just let the let the fruit show, let the fruit shine. I agree. Well, I don't know if you can see me anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Can you or not? I Am I on? I can see you. Okay. Yeah, I, well, you're good. You're good. I got Adobe just flashed. Now I've been doing this uh, for uh, six months and I've never had it, anything happen like this. So we'll just continue on. I'll make believe, I remember what you guys look like and we'll do that. Uh, Bruce, what about uh, up, up, upstate? What's going on with the uh, blends, red blends? So, you know, I think the red blend is a little less um, likely to include Cabernet Sauvignon up here because we can't get that grape to fully ripen every single year. So what that leaves you with are other grapes that aren't coming across as the traditional Bordeaux blend. We do have planted, we have Merlot, we have Cap Franc, we have some Cabernet Sauvignon planted, but I don't think we'll ever, um, I know we'll never be known or even a, be able to produce wines with this this style in them. It's just not, it's just not in our climate up here. We make, you know, the, we make um, a, we make a Merlot Cabernet Franc blend, kind of a right bank uh, Bordeaux style, which is really really nice. But it's not this wine for sure. Well, it just occurred to me that if the Hargrave started in 1973, Rebecca, oh, you're listening, and everybody else from New York State is here. You're coming up to your 50th anniversary in Long Island. And uh, here, here's for the new young people, uh, you know, who always thought Long Island has been making wines uh, for, um, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Long Island's coming up to the 50th. So just all the things when you're talking about Merlot or Cabernet Franc. And I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Bruce, what is the grape variety you think uh, in the Finger Lakes uh, red? Is it Cabernet Franc or is it Merlot that's going to continue um, yeah. to be? Cabernet Franc. Okay. Most definitely, most definitely. And then, and down in Long Island, Kareem, what's the grape? And now, can you see me? That's the question. You're mu you're muted, Kareem. Oh, Kareem's muted. Sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> I was trying to say I, I hate being asked that question because I don't being like being pinned to one variety. I mean, on Long Island, at least here at Pominock, and I know several of my colleagues agree, uh, we like to celebrate the, the breadth of what we have. And um, But, you know, look, I mean, we know that Merlot and Cabernet Franc have done well here, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. At Pominock, we're excited about Chenin, of course. And uh, and so we and we grew up, we, we, had, we started off with Bordeaux varieties, now, and now we can celebrate the Loire varieties. When I, when I say now, I mean the, the test of time has shown us at Pominock that Shannon does well, Sauvignon does well, Cap Franc does well. We've now planted an acre of Melon de Bourgogne, which I'm very excited about uh, seeing how that comes along. All right, so Kareem's not gonna give me an answer, but Eric will. Go ahead, Eric, what's, what's the grape gonna be? Well, the grape that's most widely planted is Merlot. Um, okay. There's a lot of excitement about Cap Franc, but you know, uh, I think we've seen good success with Malbec, with Syrah, with lots of varietals. So um, Merlot is still always going to be a driving force here on Long Island, just because we have so much planted. It really does well. It ripens a little earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. So year in, year out, we can consistently get our Merlot ripe and still have good acid. So, um, you know, but everybody's excited about all the varietals, I believe. Okay. All right. All right. It's okay, guys. I'm not going to ask you again, ever again. But uh, uh, all right. So now uh, we, we got to get to we're doing well on time, by the way, we have 15 minutes. And by the way, I just came back on. I don't know where I've been. Uh, I was in, uh, uh, you know, internet space for a while. Uh, I, I already have the uh, virtual wine seminar follow up survey here, which is on, over on the side. But boundary breaks. Okay, Bruce. I hope you opened this one up. Did you yeah, open we've, one up we, we, we've opened this one up quite a few times. So this is a nice wine. It um, is made mm -hmm. from uh, grapes that we leave out. Uh, typically, they're harvested in uh, January, about the middle of January, when we see 15 degrees. Um, the, the, the fruit is then uh, pressed over about a 72-hour 
uh, cycle. And then this wine was fermented for about 10 months, which is a little unusual for, um, for an ice wine even. Um, the reason we make ice wine, when we started here, we were only going to make Riesling. So we, we had uh, a site with no vines on it. It's in a great location on the shore of Seneca Lake. And we said, all we're going to make is Riesling. And, and how many different styles of Riesling can you make? Well, that's a big number. And we thought, all right, when we start, we'll always have um, a dessert wine in the mix. And so we've been making ice wine since 2013, I believe. And this one's an unusual one, I think, uh, largely because of the duration of the fermentation. It's really quite unusual for them to take that long. Um, the other thing about ice wine people should know, uh, people from the kitchen would remember the Maillard reaction where you get this kind of um, caramelization that takes place when things get uh, very, very hot. Well, with, with Riesling grapes that are left out the way these are, the UV, the ultraviolet um, spectrum that's part of sunlight will actually cause the Maillard reaction in this fruit. So what you're getting is not just Riesling classic flavors, but you're getting some honey, caramel, butterscotch type notes. And that comes from the Maillard reaction. One, one thing to remember is <clears throat> you can make dessert wines by taking grapes and freezing them. Um, that allows the water that's in the juice to turn to ice. And when you press that cluster of semi frozen ice and juice, you get a more concentrated juice, but you don't get the Maillard reaction. You don't get those, that flavor layer that comes from leaving grapes out in the, on the vine uh, to be, uh, to be hit by the sun for three or four months. This is uh, so pleasant and it's not clawingly sweet. And again, what I'm stressing today in all the wines that have been presented is a balance uh, because the acidity too is there. And, and that you're all, you were up against very heavy competition uh, on this wine because uh, you know, uh, the, the ice vine uh, or that style, there's a lot of good stuff made in, in, up there in the Finger Lakes. I want to come back to you uh, in a second about Seneca Lake, but Kareem, I know that you have to depart. Are you still with us? Because I can't see. I, I am, but yeah, I am about to drop off, yeah. All right, let's look, let's, if we can go through your slides real quickly, Rebecca, uh, of, of some of the slides of showing your place, and then we'll let you go. Take care of those children. And I want to say cheers to Bruce. This wine's amazing. Beautiful wine. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. So, um, so let's go, uh, Rebecca, is that possible to go uh, back to the slides uh, that show us? And, and we have slides from everywhere. Uh, I just didn't want to start off with a slideshow, uh, but um, maybe we're not getting that right now. Kareem, you enjoy it? My slides, my slides are. Uh, I can't, are they up now? I can't see it, unfortunately. I'm just... Nope, I guess not. So um, let's see, did we talk about? It's All right, I'm gonna come back. They're cycling. They're cycling through. That's okay, our... there. When it comes on, we can talk about it. Uh, but tell us about the 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 uh, your place, the buildings, the the vineyards. Why why we're waiting for it to come on, and then you can depart. And Bruce, so, I'm going to come back to about Seneca Lake, and stuff like that. We have about 10, 15 minutes, so we're good. So uh, what what is the tell us about uh, Pamanak? So Pamanak uh, and that view right there, that's a view from our balcony. Uh, and this is the home farm I mentioned before in Akrabog that my parents purchased in 1983. It used to be an old potato farm. The winery was an old potato barn that was renovated in 1990. And, um, and, you know, since, and so since 1990, we've been in a state winery um, uh, vinifying all the fruit that we're growing here. Uh, now we, uh, today in, in 2021, we have a total of four properties at, at Pamanak. Uh, where we're farming a total of about 85 acres um, of vineyards that are, that are, you know, established vineyards. And uh, we also own and operate Palmer Vineyards, which is just north of here, um, also in, uh, in, in, in Akbar. Well, Kareem, thank you for joining us. Uh, and cheers. Well, I'll, I guess I'll go to your wine, right? The Assemblage to toast you. Thank you. Uh, and Eric, I, I know we have some slides uh, of uh, Pindar. And you know, uh, Dr. Dan, of course, I don't know who Dr. Dan was and stuff like that. But maybe you should, um, maybe you should tell us uh, a little bit about that part and, and, and your vineyard. 
the vin vineyard, Pindar Vineyards. Uh, well, Dr. Dan, um, Dr. Damianos, everybody referred to him as Dr. Dan, uh, established the vineyard in 1979, and that's the planting where the conversion unit is as well. That was the original um, block, which was ooh, 31 acres. So um, from there, we've we've expanded to you know over 120 acres, um, and that's only because certain vineyards have actually been sold off. It was it was well over 200 acres for a while. Um, we you know the family also owns Duckwalk Vineyards and Jason Vineyards as well. So it's a it's a large operation. That's the a picture of the tasting room right now. Um, this is a picture of our pavilion. That that would be a picture from our deck off the tasting room, and that is the Gewurz demeanor we're looking at right there. So um, one of the one of the Predators for our Gewurz demeanor, not only deer, raccoons, woodchucks, but guests at the vineyard uh, just picking away through the bird netting. Um, so that is the original planting. Um, and, you know, 40 years old, that's a long time for a, a grapevine. But with Bill Ackerman as the vineyard manager, he started in uh, 2016. And I started in 2018 here. So he was already in the process of getting everything back healthy, um, doing different things, doing uh, renewal pruning, you know, cutting back some of the trunks. Uh, you know, there's big knots on top of the trunks when you're 40 years old uh, and letting new growth come from lower and removing some of that older wood. And there's some dead wood in there. So, and this is a picture of the, uh, the winery building itself uh, past our sunflower field. So, um, but yeah, there's been a lot of work done recently. We're excited about what's happening now. Um, the, the wines I think are better. Uh, well, the vines are healthier, let's put it that way. So with Bill Ackerman's influence, things are healthier. It caused us to have some lower yields for a couple of years, but now the vines are actually healthier and they're gonna give us better quality fruit and more fruit. So uh, the, the whole program seems to be getting on course here and, and having a win like the Governor's Cup is validation that we're going in the right direction. And we're very excited about what the future holds. Eric, you should, can you do the dance that you did when you guys won? Absolutely the not. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. <laughs> I, I announced the awards just so you, all of you know, some of you saw it, but it was the whole uh, crew. Uh, there must have been like 15 people there and they were dancing all over the place. It was like New Year's Eve. So uh, <laughs> congratula congratulations on having a loose crew, as they say. Uh, and uh, I, I want to go uh, back uh, up to the Finger Lakes, uh, Bruce with your uh, wife, Diana, and you, uh, you put this together. Uh, I think that I correct. I know it's over a hundred acres. Uh, and, and I think one of the reasons we talked about you wanting to be there is because of Seneca Lake. So if you want to take, we'll take a look at the slides. We have a few slides for you. And then if you can talk about the lake as we go on, what, what does it do? So Seneca Lake is one of 11 Finger Lakes. It's about uh, 680 feet deep right off the uh, shore uh, of our vineyard. And what that does is that it moderates the winter temperatures for sure. And so that grape varieties that are sensitive to cold um, would not survive actually through the winter time if, if it weren't for those lakes. If you go forward on the slides a few, you'll see that's a, these are the couple of slides of Riesling that have been cooked, as I was saying earlier, out in the vineyard. We're picking them in a kind of raisiny state. We do this when it's winter time, so everybody has to dress ap appropriately. That's the crew. Um, there you see a shot of our vineyards and how close they are to the lake. Um, it's kind of like um, uh, a, a small bowl so that during the winter time, the lake never freezes because it's so deep and the, and the shoreline around it is somehow sometimes eight to 10 degrees warmer than it is at higher elevation. So that allows us to grow varieties like Merlot, um, 
like uh, Cap Franc, like Gewurztraminer, that in other parts of the Figure Lakes that it would not grow. At the same time, because it's such a cold climate, we can make ice wine. So being as close to the lake as we are allows us to grow classic um, European varieties, but the, but the um, temperatures allow us to make a true ice wine, which is really quite unusual, I think. Um, and we're really lucky. So if you look at the Figure Lakes, if you come to the Figure Lakes, um, the west side of Seneca Lake, which is um, where we are, or sorry, the east side, we get the western um, sunlight. We also get the wind coming over the lake, which also warms the air. Ripeness is everything in our, um, in our climate to get our fruit ripe, whether it's Cap Franc or Riesling or Pinot. And so we're trying to gain every edge we can to get to achieve ripeness in, uh, in our fruit. Interesting, uh, the, the vines that are closest to the, to the lake uh, are, get riper. Am I correct about this? They're, they're warmer? Uh, well, the, they, they certainly are, are more insulated against the cold temperatures. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily the ones right closest to the lake, but we can, we, the, it, um, in, in a, a light snowstorm when it's 28 degrees and up the hill from us, they're seeing an inch or two of snow. We have no snow at all. I mean, li literally within 500 yards. So it's not just... Um, speculation and you can see it whenever there's a snowstorm. This is an image of the Finger Lakes from, from above. If you go to the next slide, um, those are the, that's Seneca Lake in the center and Cayuga Lake on the right. This is really an illustration of what I was saying earlier um, that, uh, that these lakes are so deep they never freeze. The, um, the weather conditions at the shore of the lake are a combination of the slope because cold air is denser than warm air. So it falls, it sits on the vines, but if you're on a slope, that cold air will actually run as if it were a liquid. So being on a slope close to the lake are the most advantageous conditions. And you know, you hear a lot about terroir, you hear about microclimates, um, but definitely we live one. We live in one and it's, it's not a myth at all. I, I just uh, I'm, I'm going to revert back where I started in a way to um, to uh, uh, Dr. Konstantin Frank, who came from Russia and uh, he actually came to New York City with no money and worked in as a dishwasher. Finally, he got up to the Finger Lakes, and I'm not sure. I think it might have been Gold Seal or his Great Western. He got a job there, uh, probably not in wine, but eventually they found out that he knew something about wine, and and he said to his name was Charles Fournier, the Frenchman. He said. Um, Okay, um, uh, I want to. If Dr. Frank says I want to grow Riesling and, and Chardonnay here, and everybody laughed at him. They said, well, "Are you kidding with me? It's too cold. Nobody could ever do that." Of course, I think they were also trying to protect the other grapes that they were growing, which are traditional grapes like the Vitis Labrusca, Concord, and Catawba, and things like that, which is big industry. But uh, obviously, Dr. Frank proved them wrong. We we owe a lot to him uh, on that. Uh, and then, Eric, is there something about the, the, the water around you guys that helps? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're moderated by uh, the Peconic Bay to the south and then uh, the sound to the north. So we're completely surrounded by water here. Um, it is Long Island. <laughs> so yep. uh, we're very fortunate. We have a really long growing season. Uh, we, I mean, we already have bud break at this point. Um, and no fear of a frost at this point, the, nothing's frozen over. So there's, it's the moderating effects from the waters around us allow us a longer growing season and less risk of frost. Well, we're almost at the end. I got a couple of questions, but um, you know, the uh, actually one one is for Kareem. So we'll, we'll get it to him. You know, what is pH and TA of bottled Palmenac? I thought that was on the sheets uh, of, that was from Donald. And then David, you know, I'm trying, I'm going to abbreviate your question a little bit um, uh, to Bruce. Uh, what, what, what's the yeast that you're using? Um, again, uh, he's, he's, he's very you know, I, it's not the conventional yeast that most uh, typical still wines table, the wines we make uh, here for um, that are not dessert wines. The name of the yeast actually I, I, has escaped me for the moment, but it's not the same one. It's, it's not, but it is a, 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 a Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, yeast. Uh, this particular strain, I'll have to get back to you on, but it's not a, a non uh, Saccharomyces 
uh, use stream. Okay. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to end off here. Um, I'm, I'm thank you to all. Uh, like we're sort of like finishing like perfectly on time here. Um, which anybody that took my wine class in New York started at seven, it ended at nine, and that's the way it was. Um, Eric, any parting words? Uh, you you are now. You, you got to be sitting pretty uh, with your awards. So, com final comment, Eric. Uh, uh, thank you, for everyone, for attending, and thank you, Kevin. Uh, this has been fun. It was great to taste these wines. Bruce, delicious. It was a great way to end the tasting. Um, the cream's already gone, but uh, fantastic wines, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys all again soon. And Bruce, are you are you still flying right now? You should land. Yeah, yeah. The plane is running out of gas, so I'm going to have to glide. I'm going to glide in here. So one only thing I would say is, you know, these wines are judged blind by a group out in out in Chicago, the Beverage Testing Institute. So um, every year, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation gathers wines from all over the state, and it's nice to get you know competitions all of you know are a little bit subjective so you're, you're always going to get something that's a little bit unpredictable sometimes but knowing that the quality of these wines were are were, were judged from a, almost 700 wines across the state what you see are some really great wines i think i think eric i think kareem i think ryan uh ryan bossert who, who who's the owner at ryan william this stuff's great and and i think it'll every year when you come back and taste these wines that are winners I think you should agree. It's great. It's a great thing. And thanks to the New York Wine and Grape Foundation because they're putting, I think, the right level of support behind the work that we're all doing here. Thank And thank you, Kevin, uh, for um, kind of giving your time and attention. Well, I'm going to come up and fly the plane with you. You need a co-pilot, you know. <laughs> and Eric, I'll, I'll ride my motorcycle. Excuse me. I'll ride my motor scooter down to see you. <laughs> Uh, but also, finally, I would, uh, with the New York Wine and Grape Foundation um, and NewYorkWines.org, by the way, boldly New York. Uh, I think this, uh, and I'm, I, you know, a lot of you know me from teaching the class live. I got to tell you something. If you told me this a year ago, I didn't even know what Zoom was, that we could get this much done in this short period of time and it, that, that, that you people have the wines in front of you uh, is amazing. And you can ask questions at any time. In all honesty, I'm thinking now that the Zoom format for wine tastings, uh, if you have the same wine in front of you, of course, uh, are, are the future. Uh, and so I toast to the great job that uh, the New York uh, Wine and Grape Foundation has done. And I thank you all for joining. A toast, you got to pick up a glass. You know, I'm going, of course, to the ice wine. I want to finish up a little. I want to be sweeter. So thank you all and hope to see you soon. Cheers. Thank you, Kevin, Kareem, Eric, and Bruce. Uh, as a reminder, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event in this series. The first episode of our Grower Series will begin next Tuesday, May 4th at 11 a.m. with Bud Break in New York with Alice Wise. We hope to see you there. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you again for attending. <laughs>